In 2018, the most powerful underwater earthquake occurred between East Africa and Madagascar. There was a deep rift between the Earth's crust and the mantle. Hundreds of thousands of tons of magma came out on the surface of the ocean floor. After that, a huge underwater volcano with a height of 2,700 feet was formed near the coast of Madagascar. This is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. And all this is hidden under the water. French scientists studied this place since it had regular seismic activity. When the geologists went on an expedition to the coast of Madagascar, they discovered this giant underwater rock, which was not here until recently. With the help of geological equipment, they discovered the earthquake happened deeper than usual, below the Earth's crust. Geologists created a special observatory to monitor the situation at this site in real time. Between February and May 2019, they recorded about 17,000 seismic activities below the ocean floor. Scientists had never recorded such deep earthquakes. This suggests that there are reservoirs and drainage systems inside our planet through which magma flows. It's like the veins and vessels of a living organism. The volume of lava the volcano spews at this place can be compared with the volcanic eruptions in the hottest spots of Earth. Perhaps this is one of the most catastrophic, but at the same time, beautiful events in nature over the past few years. To understand what can be beautiful about this, let's first figure out what an underwater volcano is and how it works. Inside our planet, there are incandescent liquid metals and molten rocks containing almost all the chemical elements from the periodic table. All this hot substance is called magma, which constantly flows in the planet's bowels. Anyway, magma is lighter than the surrounding Earth's crust, so it always tries to break out upwards. Fortunately, the surface of our planet is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes it happens, and here's why. The Earth's crust consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other because of movement. Imagine a massive picture of puzzles. Each detail of this puzzle is a tectonic plate, and they all are constantly moving. Sometimes one puzzle gets unhooked from another. When this happens, magma immediately spills out of the resulting gap. And these places of faults with flowing magma we call volcanoes. When such a volcano erupts, a new geology begins. A splash of magma shakes the ocean floor. Lava and ash erupt from the inside of our planet. It causes a release of destructive energy of incredible power. But thanks to the water, such a catastrophe can go unnoticed. More than 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. But inside the water, there's a total mess. Lava heats the water and destroys the seabed. The ocean in this area boils, and large air bubbles rise up. But the enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's destructive power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed. The ocean blocks the consequences of the disaster. But sometimes, the eruption gets to the surface. Such a case occurred in 2012. Vast pieces of pumice the size of a van began to float up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were hundreds, even thousands of them. It was more like a group of unknown islands. Volcanic rocks scattered in the ocean over an area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists used deep-sea sonar apparatus on the remote control to determine the full scale of the disaster. They studied the seabed for a long time and found 14 craters that released lava. The researchers saw that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and scattered throughout the ocean. The rest was scattered along the bottom. It destroyed all marine life in the area. However, after the eruption of volcanoes, life is reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Volcanic ash, lava, and soil around the volcano contain many useful elements and minerals. They nourish the soil and promote the development of microorganisms not only on land but also in water. That's why there's so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form natural islands. 
This is a long process, resulting from which a large piece of land comes out of the water. When magma goes out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. The eruption can go on for a long time. The release magma raises the level of the seabed. After another hundred, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows lay a new layer on the surface of the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano has been growing. It's slowly rising up because of constant eruptions. Some volcanoes may go out forever, and some continue to erupt. And then, one day, the level of volcanic rock reaches the surface in the form of a huge island. After many more years, the volcano may go out, and then life appears on the formed island. The destroyed seabed area is filled with animals, trees, flowers, and plants. These volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth was born. There are hundreds of islands around the world that have appeared because of eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people. They build villages and small towns there. The ground on such islands is fertile. Fruits and vegetables grow there. The water is filled with fish. Such places may seem like paradise, but at the same time, it's dangerous to live there because the volcano may wake up. One of the most famous eruptions occurred on the island of Ogashima, south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful city right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, the eruption began. No one expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose and flew away from the island. And then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from beneath the underground depths. Thick smoke escaped from the top of the green volcano. The mountain threw dirt, large rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People managed to evacuate. And then there was a long recovery. Locals rebuilt the houses and brought the city back. Almost 250 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano has never woken up. Despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue to live there. The population is growing since this place resembles paradise, and no one wants to leave it. There are thermal springs, dense jungles with rich soil, and many fish. Meteorological and seismological services constantly monitor the volcano's activity. Movements and fractures of tectonic plates create another natural disaster, destructive tsunamis. Unlike volcanoes, huge waves are formed when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically, up or down. When this happens, water pressure shifts on the ocean floor, which releases energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you form a small wave when you throw a stone into the water. First, a small tsunami appears. Then it picks up speed and increases in size. Its height can reach the level of a five-story building. It's heading for the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is almost twice as fast as a Formula One race car. Millions of gallons of water, weighing thousands of tons, are getting closer. And now, the wave reaches the shore and demolishes everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. Such tsunamis are a frequent occurrence on the coast of Japan. People have built massive shields near the land to stop the waves before they hit the shore. Still, in spite of all preparedness, somehow, nature always prevails. Oh wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean. It seems that the ocean has a leak, but it's not like a leak you would expect where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, 
But instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kind of acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad, in the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960 and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about four inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia a road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solin. The site of Solin was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. 
The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well-preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kind of looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viper fish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. 
The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom.
In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the U.S., Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started but not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. 
the biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T. rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. 
This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in free fall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. On a sunny day, a man was diving in shallow waters near South Africa. At one point, he saw something that didn't catch his eye at first. A pile of shells that looked as if it had been put together. Maybe by some other diver, he must have told himself. But out of all these shells came the most unusual of creatures, an octopus. The gorgeous underwater animal looked straight at the man before swimming away. Impressed by his new acquaintance, the diver started visiting the octopus every day. He watched it use shells and seaweed to protect itself and learned how it hunted and cared for its eggs. All these encounters became the basis for a now famous documentary. In the movie, the diver wanted to study the relationship between a wild octopus and its observer. Initially, the octopus was a bit too shy to let the man get close. But over time, it began to trust him and even explored his body. At one point, the octopus even rested on the diver's chest. The man soon began to look at the underwater creature as his octopus friend. Sure, the documentary did make it look like a true friendship, but that was most likely because of all the close-ups and eerie music. But you can't really know what the octopus is thinking. Maybe what looks like tenderness is just curiosity or confusion. Maybe an apparent hug is really just a defense mechanism. Some people may love octopuses, but can they really be friends with a human? Until they learn to talk, I guess we'll never know. That doesn't make an octopus less of an interesting creature though. Apart from those quirky sets of tentacles, obviously octopuses have another characteristic that sets them apart from other sea creatures. A recent study that involved studying the footage of octopuses living underwater shows that they sometimes develop this unusual behavior. They seem to throw things at each other on purpose. It can be anything from dirt from the bottom of the sea to shells or rocks. Octopuses are known to be solitary creatures, so when something or someone like an underwater camera person gets too close to them, they might lash out. Just as we have yet to discover the limits of our galaxies and constellations, we know very little about the bottom of the sea. It's one of the reasons why we find it so hard to explain the behavior of some underwater creatures. The truth is, we don't have good enough technology able to deal with harsh conditions and a limited amount of light underwater. You might have asked yourself at one point, what's the deepest part of the ocean? It's called the Mariana Trench. We don't really know exactly how deep this giant hole is since it's too difficult to measure, but it's somewhere around 6.8 miles deep and five times longer than the Grand Canyon. This massive underwater trench was first studied back in 1875 with the help of a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director reached the bottom of the trench in a submersible vessel called the Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet were discovered here, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench got its name from the nearby Mariana Islands, which were named Las Marianas in honor of Spanish Queen Mariana of Austria. The Mariana Trench might be the deepest part of the ocean that we know of, but one other mysterious phenomenon that's interesting for researchers is called phantom bottoms. 
In the late 1940s, when the sonar became standard equipment, ships and submarines noticed unexpected signals coming from the ocean. Those signals came from areas where no seafloor was supposed to exist. What's even more mysterious is that this fake seafloor appeared to move. One researcher at Scripps University found out that these phantom bottoms showing on maps were indeed alive. They were made out of a layer of jellyfish, shrimps, and other deep sea creatures. The reason why they move is that they rise to the surface at night to feed. To top it all off, even the way these creatures move is kind of calculated. They don't just move randomly, but seem to gather together by species. We used to believe underwater animals behave this way only to avoid being caught by predators. It's a mystery to scientists why they group in the same way to form a fake seabed. Our curiosity about the deep waters doesn't stop at the seafloor. If you went on a vacation to the beach when you were young, you probably remember the fun of digging in the sand. As the hole got deeper, you may have asked yourself, could I dig all the way to the other side of the earth? None of us have ever found out. Our parents took us home when it got dark and chilly. Scientists are more reasonable when it comes to this subject. For starters, they know the best place to start digging would be underwater, since those regions are already deeper than what we can find on land. They also do not have the ambition to drill a tunnel through Earth. It's not even possible. That's mostly because of the extreme heat and pressure inside our planet. Even if we could technically dig a tunnel, it would not be safe to travel through it. However, reaching the mantle and retrieving a sample would be a huge scientific achievement, similar to landing on the moon. What we live on is called Earth's crust. Underneath it, there are other layers called the mantle, outer core, and inner core. Researchers have been trying to drill into Earth's mantle since the 1960s, but they haven't succeeded. Some failed due to technical issues, and others were unlucky and chose the wrong places to drill. Our planet's mantle is made of molten rock. Wouldn't that be dangerous if we ever reached it? Scientists say we have nothing to worry about, though. If and when the drillers eventually pierce through the crust underwater, hot molten rock won't pop up the hole and spill onto the seafloor like it would during a volcanic eruption. Mantle rocks aren't solid, sure, but they move slowly, at the same speed as your fingernails grow. Another of those famous deep sea mysteries is that of the 1997 Bluke. You heard that right. I'm talking about a weird sound that seemed to come from deep under the waves. People heard it in the South Pacific. No one had ever recounted a sound like that before. Some thought it must have been emitted by a strange creature living deep in the ocean. It didn't help that the noise came from a location mentioned in a story by famous writer H.P. Lovecraft. In his story, it was a creature called Cthulhu that lived there. In the novel, the author described it as a large, human-like monster with tentacles on its face and wings on its back. For many years, people tried to figure out where the noise came from. It wasn't until 2005 that they concluded it was from icebergs breaking off of glaciers. Some people still don't believe that this explanation truly makes sense and are searching for a different reason for the blue. If creatures living outside of our planet ever decided to come to visit, you wouldn't expect them to go straight to the bottom of the sea, right? Well, some people claim there's a sort of spaceship on the ocean floor discovered in 2011. It's basically an oval-shaped object located on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. In 2012, a team of divers explored the anomaly and found what appeared to be a staircase and other structures on its surface. This only added to the belief that the large object had been made by someone and wasn't just a natural phenomenon. Even more bizarre, close to the unidentified anomaly, the explorer's electrical equipment, like sonar instruments and satellite phones, started to malfunction. Some scientists believe it just to be a glacial deposit or some other natural formation, but they still don't know for sure what it is. 
Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard, and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more. But getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of oceans so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. 
they don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets, where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened, at least the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, 
but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. 
But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks can live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly. But some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents, and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991 
which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super-eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super-eruption would be ash and ashfall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super-eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super-eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. 
Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot, toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal, as how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well... So I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost ten times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. 
It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys. These are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. 
It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a 5-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Les Kintyre Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day making it way more dramatic in monochrome. The Georgia Guidestones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 
and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes Al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood Falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, Unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the saltwater. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity, out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socatra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the dragon tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world. The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. 
When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it. Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, 
creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best-preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. 
The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater.